take it out of the Gospel of John. John chapter 19. We started a few weeks ago looking at uh, the gardens or some of the gardens in the Bible. And um, they, um, in many ways, represent for us uh, kind of a, uh, a journey through life. Uh, some of the stages that we uh, have in life, and we look uh, to begin with all the way back in Genesis at the Garden of Eden, and the sin, and how. And then we last week we moved forward to to the to the New Testament, and uh, looked at the Garden uh, of Gethsemane, and how uh, sorrow was dealt with, and how uh, Jesus in his great sorrow there, uh, how, how it was responded to, and what we can learn from it. Uh, this morning I want to move forward uh, just a couple of days, and move forward to the Garden of Golgotha. Uh, John chapter 19 tells us that uh, near the place where Christ was crucified, uh, there was a garden called Golgotha with an open tomb, an empty tomb, and that they laid Christ. Uh, body in that tomb after his uh, crucifixion. And as we look at that, uh, I want to tackle a, a topic this morning that, uh, quite honestly, uh, we don't deal with a, a lot in, in the church. We, we, just, um, uh, we just don't talk about very often how to deal, uh, how we should respond, how we should react to the things that go right in our life. Uh, in, in the church so often uh, we talk about last week when we talked about sorrow uh, Tommy asked a while ago if anybody had experienced sorrow we all know uh, about sorrow and many of our songs many of our sermons uh, many of our lessons are about how uh, believers should uh, react how we should uh, respond in, in times of grief and pain and suffering and, and how we should uh, trust God even in the bad times uh, and so this morning I uh, want to move into a different garden we've looked at sin and sorrow this morning I uh, want to take I guess what you would say a little bit uh, lighter topic uh, a little bit uh, lighter topic but one that I think honestly uh, may even be more difficult for most of us uh, to deal with most of us, uh, we just automatically uh, deal with sorrow. Uh, we automatically deal with grief. We know what to do. When bad times come, you cry. You know, that, that's just, you know, we, we, we know how to deal with the hard times and the bad times of life. You, when bad times come, you complain, you moan, and you groan. We, we know how to do that. We've, we, we've got that down to an art. We, we have that uh, down to a science, how to deal uh, when bad times come. When sorrow comes, we looked last week at sorrow, uh, and, and we know how to, uh, to do that. We just moan, groan, write, and complain, make everybody else miserable around us. That's, you know, that, that's the American way of dealing. Uh, with sorrow. Uh, but how do we deal when, when things go right? Uh, and how do we uh, deal with success? How do we deal uh, with victory? We sing victory in Jesus, but I'm not sure we know how to, uh, to live like we have uh, victory in Jesus. And so this morning, I want us to go back, and we're going to look here at, at the familiar story. I, I know this is uh, a text that normally would be Easter, uh, but uh, the resurrection of Christ, and see how uh, Mary, how Peter, how John, how these disciples reacted to the greatest victory that had ever been won. Uh, the greatest victory that, that will ever be won, and that was Christ. Uh, victory over death, hell, the grave, uh, setting us free from uh, the penalty of sin. How did uh, Mary and, and his followers, how uh, did they react to it? We saw them. We know they know how to react to hard times. They, uh, just a few days ago, uh, that, uh, that uh, rest evening there in the Garden of Gethsemane when the soldiers came and arrested Christ, uh, they ran off into the dark like cockroaches when the light comes on. They, they, they knew how to, uh, to handle it. They ran, ran and uh, hid in the upper room and were, were afraid uh, for their life. They know how to deal uh, with sorrow. But, but how will they deal with success? I, I think we, uh, that, that we know that a lot of folks Folks, uh, we don't know how to deal with success. I, I think you see that uh, in, in numbers. Uh, we uh, all hear about uh, the lottery and the big prizes that people win uh, in the lottery now. Uh, but I, I read something somewhere that said it's like uh, it's a little over 90%, I believe, of the people uh, who win over a million dollars in the lottery uh, are broke within five years and filing bankruptcy. Uh, typically speaking, we just don't know how uh, to deal with good things. 
blessings and success. Uh, some of us are uh, like the character I saw on television. He started having uh, some things go his way. He got a uh, promotion, a raise at work, and uh, some things went right with his kids. And, uh, and, and he got real nervous. He said, we just don't have good things happen to us in our family. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about, you know, he got real paranoid when good things started happening. He was afraid, you know, what, what, what's going to, you know, when, when's the sky going to fall? And, uh, you know, and, and some of us are that way. We just, we don't know. We, some, some, I believe, honestly, even feel guilty uh, for feeling happy. Uh, you know, it's almost like good things happen and, you know, well, this is not supposed to happen to me. This is, you know, this always happens to somebody else. We don't ever win. You know, we never, you know, and, and that's the way uh, we respond to, uh, to the blessings, to the good things in, in our life. And so this morning, I, I want us to look at this, uh, this familiar story and, uh, and look at it kind of from the disciples and, uh, and, and Mary Magdalene and how they react, how they respond uh, when they get there and they get the best news that they have, uh, that they've ever received. Again, uh, they went there. The Bible uh, tells us Christ crucified uh, on the day before the Sabbath. And so they basically uh, just kind of got him in the ground. They just got him in the tomb. Uh, they didn't finish all the prep work that they wanted to do uh, because the Sabbath began at uh, 6 o'clock that evening. They couldn't work uh, on the Sabbath. And so they just uh, got him in the tomb, rolled the stone on top of the tomb, and said, we'll come back first of the week and we'll uh, finish the task. And so... They have spent uh, the last hours miserable. They have spent the last hours in mourning for Jesus, grieving over Him. They have spent the last hours uh, worrying about their own future. Are they going to, uh, they came for Christ, they've crucified Christ, will they come for His followers next? Uh, they have uh, spent the last uh, day or so now in just total shock, disbelief, terror, uh, every negative uh, emotion you can think of, they have, they have experienced it to its fullest. And now they arrive at an empty tomb. And, and immediately their thought is not joy, joy. Uh, their immediate thought is more bad news. Uh, they, uh, Mary tells us here in this passage. She goes back uh, in, in chapter 20 uh, and tells us that uh, she, she goes, Mary and goes and goes back and says, Listen, somebody has stolen the body. And so even Mary at that moment has this uh, horrible uh, dread. Even in the, in the face of uh, great news, she doesn't see it that way. She sees somebody stolen the body. Oh, no. What, what has happened now? And, and it's only after uh, Jesus appears and speaks to him that she finally realizes the, uh, the victory. So how is it that, that we respond to good news? How do we react to success? Uh, how, how do we react to the, to the victories in life? I think any of you that have ever been around uh, athletics and sports uh, know that uh, you know, it's as difficult to be a good winner as it is to be a good loser. Uh, it, it's very difficult. And, and so how do we as believers, how do we react, how do we respond, how, how do we act uh, when God blesses us, when there are uh, victories in our life? And, and so I want you to see with me uh, three things that, uh, that, that we draw from this story that, that I think as believers uh, we need to adopt. Because uh, just as sure, as Tommy asked you a while ago, how many of you have ever had sorrow and every hand in the place went up, I could ask you how many of you have ever had a victory how many of you have ever been blessed? How many of you ever had some God has been good to you? And surely every hand, if not both hands, would go up across this building. So all of us uh, have had blessings in our life, and, and I hope uh, you'll have some more. You had one today. You've already had several. You woke up uh, on the green side of the dirt this morning. And so, uh, you know, you're still breathing, and, uh, you know, you're here. Uh, we're not meeting uh, under the threat of, of armed guards bursting in and, uh, and, and attacking us for worshiping. And so uh, we don't not only have been blessed, we're being blessed at this uh, very moment. You're sitting, uh, most of you, with a, a copy of God's Word open, either uh, on your, in your Bible or on your phone or your iPad or something. You're, 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 you have access to a copy uh, of God's Word. You've not just been blessed, you are being blessed. And so how do we react? How do we uh, respond? How do we live? live in light of those blessings. Three things that, that we need to understand, that we need to, uh, to implement in our life. First one is, uh, very simple, that because uh, of the blessings that, that are uh, present in our life, because of the things uh, that God has done for us, it demands 
that we serve. It, they, they demand that we serve. How can we not serve a God who has blessed us in so many ways? How can we not uh, work for a God uh, that has given us so many things, done uh, so many things for us? How can we not uh, work for Him, do anything He asks? I don't guess there's ever been a, uh, a, a, a television show uh, on television that hasn't at some point had one of those storylines where, uh, you know, all the way back to Andy Griffith, somebody, you know, Gomer saved Andy, or Andy saved Gomer's life, and now Gomer thinks he's got to do something to pay pay Andy back. I mean, that's just the way, generally speaking, uh, we work. Somebody does something for us. Uh, you know, we've got a flat tire. Somebody pulls over and uh, and helps us. We want to do something back. We're out of gas. Uh, somebody, you know, gets us some gas. We want to do something to help them back. We're sick. We're hurting. Somebody fixes us a meal. We want to do something to pay them back. We want to help them. We want to serve them because they did something for us. How much more do we owe, how much more should we serve God considering all the blessings, all the things uh, that He has done for us? And I'm not even uh, this morning, listen, when we look at this story, Mary Magdalene and Peter and, and, and John, these disciples, after they see the, the empty tomb, we've got a group of men, we've got some folks here who just a few hours ago, one of them was saying, I don't even know Him. You know, I, I don't even know who he is. What do you mean? I've never, you know, no, I don't know him. We've got uh, a, a group of men, one of them saying, I don't know him. We don't know what the other ten were doing because they had run off into the darkness and, uh, and were hiding, fearful for their life. We don't know where they had scattered off to. But yet we read, if we read this story, we go forward and we read into the book of Acts, we read uh, Jewish history, we find out these same eleven men, one that denied him, ten that scattered, are the very same men that stood up at Pentecost and, and proclaimed the very name of Jesus Christ. What changed? What made them that kind of man? But what kind of made them those kind of people? What made Mary Magdalene uh, run off shouting, He's alive, He's alive? Because Jesus did something for her. It was a great victory in her life. And we, every day of our life, are surrounded by victories. Every day, every breath we take is a Victory is a blessing, is a success from an almighty God. Every time our heart contracts and sends our blood pumping through our body, then we have been blessed of God. Every time you look in those pictures of your grandchildren, of your children, every time you look in your, your, your car, every time you walk in your house, every time you go to the pantry and you open up the cabinet doors and there's food on the, ca on the shelves, every time you go to the refrigerator, every time you push the button on that thermostat, and the air conditioner, the heat comes on. Every time you flip a switch and the lights come on, is a reminder that God has been good to you. Then how can we not serve Him? How can we not serve Him? How can it's simple fact that because of what God had, the victories. Listen, I hadn't even mentioned salvation and the resurrection. All I've talked about were the temporal blessings, the earthly blessings that He gives us each and every day. Every time you see the American flag run up a flag post and you are a citizen of the greatest nation on the face of this earth, you've been blessed by God. You could be Turkish. You could be, uh, you know, Russian. You know, worse, you could be an American in Turkey. You know, listen... You know, we have been blessed every time you look around you. I, I love what David Maine says. David Maine says we need to learn to go on a God hunt. Everywhere we look, he says, go out and just look around and you will see God at work. Every time you see the flowers bloom, every time you hear a baby cry, every time you, you see a cloud, the sun, the rain, everything, all those things all around us, God is saying, see my handiwork. You are blessed. Now, let's get down to the meat and nuts and bolts of the story here. Let's be reminded of what sent these people to service, and that was the fact that Jesus Christ had defeated death, hell, and the grave, not because He needed to, not because it added anything to 
his fame or fortune. He was God, is God, always will be God, resurrected or not. He was God. He didn't have to come do any of those things. He could have left us to our own devices and left us to spend an eternity in hell. But he loved us enough that he came, died on a cross, shed his blood, spent three nights in a tomb, raised on the dead, sat on the right hand of his father, waiting to return again. Folks, we have all the reason we need to serve him. Listen, we shouldn't have to beg for people to serve Jesus. We shouldn't have to beg for for folks to work. Listen, we ought to be running around. We ought to be like Gomer was with Andy. You remember? Do I I need? I got all of them on DVD. If y'all want to, we'll come back this afternoon and watch them. Do I need to remind you how that went? Gomer was out looking for something to do for Andy. He said, let me fix the furnace. Let me, let me wash the car. Let me. He went out looking for a way to pay Andy back because he thought Andy had saved his life. Listen, if you're here this morning, you're a child of God. You know he saved your life. There shouldn't be any wondering about it. There should be nothing. You know, I, I sometimes, I, I, I'll be perfectly honest with you, I hear missionary stories sometimes. And I hear them talking about going to some of these third world countries. And I hear them talking about the conditions that they live in and the threats they have to deal with and the circumstances they minister under. And I'll be brutally honest with you. I sit and I hear their stories sometimes and I think, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. I couldn't pack up my stuff and go to Thailand, one of these little small countries where we couldn't even... We, we can't even tell. We can't even tell where our missionaries are today. We can't even. Used to, you could go and you could get a list from the mission board of the missionaries and where they were, so you could pray for them. We can't do that anymore. We have to, some of the countries we can't tell they're in, and most of them we can't give their real names because of the danger they're serving under. And I look at that and say, many times I couldn't do that. Just like probably many of you do, I couldn't do that. But shouldn't I be able to? Because the same God that died for them, the same God that loves them, loved me. And if they can go to Thailand, if they can go to Pakistan, if they can go to some of these little countries, surely, surely we can knock on our neighbor's door. Surely we can tell somebody about Jesus right here. Surely we can serve Him. Listen, as much as God has done for us, all the victories. But you know what? You you get a group of people together and you listen to them. This is the way we operate. We get together in a circle and here's what happens. Man, man, my arm. My arm is just killing me. It's the worst thing ever happened. And and, and in just a minute, about the time I get done telling the story about how bad my arm is, somebody else in that circle will say, man, you just know no nothing. I got it in both my arms. And in just a minute, when they get done telling about both their arms, somebody else in that circle goes, you just don't know nothing. I got it in my arm, done run up to my neck. And before long, one of them standing there run down in my leg. And, you know, it, it, it just turns into a, you know, into a great big proverbial groan, moan, complain, make everybody else miserable circle. You know, that, that's what it turns into. Listen, if I ask you again, uh, how many of you had hard times? How many of you have aches and pains? I, I know I'm, I, I'm getting there where, you know, you get to the point, you come to the age where you hurt in places you didn't even know you had. You know, I understand that. I, I know about age. I'm starting to figure it out now that I'm 30. I got to, I, I'm understanding all that. But listen, I also know God's good. I also know, thank God, that for every pain he's given that, that I've managed to have, he's managed to, generally speaking, find some kind of medicine that he'd knock it out. You know, listen, he's, found, you know, he's put doctors on every corner, drugstore on the corners where there's not a doctor. You know, get, give me a nice king-size air mattress. You know, give me a nice recliner. Give me a heating pad. You know, he, he's given me all kinds of things. Listen, we can focus on the things that we complain about, or we can say, you know what? God's been good to me, and I'm going to live like it. I, I, I'm going to live like God. Some of y'all look at me like y'all been miserable all your life and don't see no hope. Like it's raining a 100% chance for more. Listen, anybody in here God ever been good to? Now, I got a question. Tommy asked you if any of you ever had sorrow. I asked you if you got ever been good. Yeah. 
Do you think that might be indicative of the problem? That we don't know how to deal with the good things? Listen, we'd rather focus on the bad things. We'd rather moan and groan and gripe about the things we don't have than to praise God for the things we do. Listen, because of the goodness of God, we ought to be willing to serve Him. Not do we, does it demand that we serve Him? I want you to see this. How does it demand that we serve? It, it describes, it, it defines for us uh, our, our life. Look what happens here. These people, when we look at their life, first they, read, they come and, and they roll away. And if you keep reading the story, from that day forward, those men, those women, their life was changed because of this day. Because of what God had done. Their life was different because of that. We've got a man by the name here in this story of Peter. We'll just focus on Peter for a moment. Peter is a man who just a few chapters ago was taking his eyes off Jesus, sinking in the water. Who just a chapter ago was denying that he even knew Christ. And, you know, and, and, and not trusting Christ. We, we've got, uh, again, men like these disciples that ran off into the darkness. And yet, we turn over just a few chapters into the book of Acts. And we have this very same man, Peter, who was denying that he ever knew Christ, standing up on Pentecost, looking at the men and women who sent Christ to Calvary, looking at them, pointing his long finger at them. You think I got a long one? Peter pointed his long finger, shook it right under their nose and said you murdered the very son of God something changed in that old boy something happened to Peter to go from standing in front of a little teenage girl and saying I don't know him I've never met him you don't know what you're talking about to facing the leaders the political the spiritual leaders of his town saying you are a bunch of murderers what happened the greatest victory in history happened and Peter planned his life lived his life based on the fact that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Peter said, listen, I, you know, a few days ago, yeah, I think if you'd have went to Peter and said, Peter, did you used to be a coward? He'd have said, afraid so. Peter, are you a coward today? Not anymore. Why, Peter? Did you start lifting weights? Did you start going to the gym? Peter, did you eat your spinach? Did you eat your Wheaties? What changed, Peter? He said, Jesus changed everything when He defeated death, hell, and the grave. And I don't have to be afraid anymore because greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. I am now more than a conqueror. I don't have to live in fear. I don't have to live in shame because I know my God is greater than anything this world throws at me. Listen. We can focus on all the bad things that's gone wrong. Or we can say, you know what? My God has been good to me and live our life accordingly. Listen, I I, I want to remind you what Paul said. Paul said what? For me to die is gain. He said, you know what? And I want to tell you, I want to remind you something. When, you know, it's one thing for me or you to stand here today and say, well, you know, I praise God I'm going to heaven when I die. That sounds good, but let's be honest. Most of us sitting here today saying that are saying that, hedging our bet just a little bit. Because we know that, well, we don't know, but we're all pretty comfortable that we're we're in decent health and barring, you know, like that plane over in Mount Holly flying over and dropping stuff on the golf course or something, dropping something on our head, you know, that, that we're in pretty good shape. When Paul said, for me to die is gain, you remember, any of you here besides me watch Looney Tunes? Nobody raised your hand, but a few of you look guilty. You know, you, you remember there was one of them, old Elmer Fudd was out in the barnyard, and he had his grinding stone sharpening the axe right outside the chicken coop. You remember that one? Don't sit there like y'all never watched the Looney Tunes. Pansy watched them. I'm, I'm in my people. You know, and, and, and sharpening the axe. Right outside the chicken coop. That chicken could hear the, uh, the, the, the axe being sharpened. He knew his days was done. I want to tell you something. When Paul said for me to die is gain, they were just outside his coop sharpening the axe. See, in all likelihood, before Timothy received those words, 
Paul was already dead. Paul knew when he said for me to die is gain, die was in the room next door. He knew that. He knew that the very next time that door came open, that may be the last time that door was open for him. And Paul said, you know what? The worst thing this world can do to me is the best thing this world can do for me. See, the world thinks they can do something. I, 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 I'll go in another direction. Since y'all didn't watch Looney Tunes, you know about Briar Rabbit, don't you? What they do to Briar Oh, don't throw me in that Briar Patch. You know, what did the old wolf do? Threw him right in the Briar Patch. I want to tell you something. If you're a child of God and the world tries to throw you in the Briar Patch called a cemetery, they've just done the best thing they could do for you, and that's put you in the presence of God. Listen, I want to tell you something. When we understand that our God is a good God, a loving God, a victorious God, then we can live our life a little differently. We can live our life a whole lot differently. I, I, I like the story. You, you might have heard it about the two old fellows that wasn't real bright and, and is watching the news one afternoon, and they showed a guy jump off the roof of a building, take his own life. When the news come back on at 530, the one of them sitting there, he says, I bet he don't jump. And the other says, I'll take that bet. They bet five dollars he wouldn't jump. And sure enough, he jumped off. And the old guy started to pay up. And the other said, I can't take your money. I, I got to admit, I, 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 I saw that earlier. I, I, he said, the other says, well, you know, I did too, but I didn't think he'd do it again. <laughs> Listen, we, we, we focus on the bad. We, we look for the bad. Listen, we, we, we can live our life like we already know the future because we do. How, how much differently would we live our life? Think about it. If, if, you know, if, uh, you know, if we knew the outcome of everything tomorrow, how much would that affect? Listen, I know the outcome of everything tomorrow. God wins. I know the outcome of everything in future. God wins. And I can live my life accordingly. I can live and, and strategize and plan my life that way. I don't have to go through life uh, hiding and ashamed and scared. I can throw my head back and go through this world as a child of the king, more than a conqueror, the Bible says. Most of us are real good at going through life like this. Yeah. I want to remind you that every animal in this world, every animal in this world that goes through life with their head down is prey. Every one of them. Every one of them, if they go go home, watch old Merlin Parkins or whatever his name is in the Wild Kingdom or whoever them fellas are, that little Australian guy, whatever, you watch them. If an animal goes through life with his head down on the ground, he is prey. Something going to eat him. Because there's a lion or there's a tiger sitting around somewhere constantly scanning for supper. Listen, I want to tell you something. I may not be the king of the jungle, but I'm the child of the king. And I don't have to live in fear because I can plan my life. I Listen, I can plan my life. I can go through this life knowing that when this life is over, I'm going to be in the presence of my Savior. That changes everything. doesn't matter anymore what everybody else thinks. doesn't matter what this world says is right or wrong. Listen, if you're trying to please the world, we were talking this morning uh, about fashion. And, and you know how uh, you know how fashion has you know kind of steadily went downhill. But the problem is you know so has normal. You know, and, and so we don't you know both of them. You know, we don't even know what normal is anymore. I know what normal is. It's what my God says is normal. I don't have to go through life a slave to the world's thoughts and you know the changing ideas of the world and and, and all those things because I have the victory of Jesus Christ. And so it, 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 it first of all, it, it demands that I serve Him. It, it demands that I serve Him. It, 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 furthermore, then it, it designs my strategy. It tells me how to live my life because I'm the child of a king. Do you, let me ask you a question. Do you think, oh, Prince Charles over there in England, Prince Edward, whichever them princes they are, William, Bonaparte, I don't know what all their names are over there, do you think they live just a little bit differently than Kevin? You think so? Why you think so? Because they know they're the child of the king. Folks, when we know we're the child of the king, it ought to change how we live. It demands that we serve. It designs our strategy. 
And then the third thing I want you to see about it is it deserves to be shared. That's what happens. They leave and they go out and, and they come and they tell all the disciples that she's seen the Lord. She tells all the disciples she's seen the Lord. You know, I said a while ago, some people don't know how to be good losers. Some people don't know how to be good winners. Some people don't know how to do either. Listen, we are children of the King. We're living in the greatest victory ever been won. Every day, God blesses us. But every day, we go out, and you know it. We do it, we hear it. All of us do. We go out every day of our life, and somebody, we'll get in a circle, or we'll get in a group of people, and you know it, and I'm not, listen, I'm with you. I've done the same thing. How's things going? Oh, not too good. I'm really good. We're the moaning us, groaning us, griping us bunch of people ever walked the earth. Got more than any group of people ever been on this earth. And yet we moan and groan constantly. I want to tell you something. Every little victory deserves to be shared. You ever seen a young child win? You ever seen Melissa win? Listen, every victory deserves to be celebrated. You see a little child. I mean, it may not be anything or or even better than that. You ever seen an old person win a bingo game in a rest home? And if you hadn't, it's worth the trip. You ought to go to the rest home and watch them play bingo. Just one a cone. You know, you, matter of fact, you want to see both ends of the extreme. Good winners, good losers. Go watch somebody win at bingo and watch all the old people that lost at bingo. I remember used to when they played bingo down here with the old folks at Kmart. You win a five-day-old cake. And, and, and man alive, KY thought he had won the world when he won one of them cakes. You remember that? He had to know. She, you know thought he had won the world. You know, Richard would get so mad he couldn't see straight because he didn't win a five-day-old cake. Listen, instead of walking around as believers telling everybody what we don't have and what went wrong, maybe our outlook would change and maybe some people's opinion of the church would change if we shared what God has done. If we shared the good things God has blessed us with, You know, you take and you ask a grandmother, grandfather, show me a picture of your grandbaby. You know, used to, they'd whoop out their billfold and that little thing that folded out. Now you know what to do, don't you? They reach in, they, they pull out their phone, and let me show you. And then you're there all day long. They're just doing this all day long. I got 64 gigabits here. Just hang on, you know. <laughs> you know. I ain't got no phone numbers in this thing, but I can, you know, I have no idea how to call 911 on here if I'm in trouble. But let me show you my grandbaby. You know, that's, you know, that's the way we operate. That's where we are. Amen, Archie? You know, you know. How about this? If instead of saying, and I, I'm, just, I, I'm just throwing some thoughts at you. Instead of saying, let me show you my grandbaby. Let me show you the grandbabies God has blessed me with. How's that? You ever seen a young girl get engaged? You about get a bloody nose from them walking around. See my dummy? All up in your face. I said, young young girl. Yeah, listen. Why can't we be the same way about the things God's done for us? Why can't we be the same way on bragging for God? Give him, instead of, oh, I've been lucky. No, I've been blessed. God's been good to me. You ever looked at your spouse and said, hey, you know what? I've been blessed. Thank God for giving you to me. You ever looked at your children and said, Lord, I just want to thank you for these children. You ever looked at your children, looked at them and told them, you, you might be surprised at the difference how they'd act if you looked at the children and, and said, you act like your mother. 
which is a lot of time the truth, Malia. Um, act like your mother. But to look at those babies and say, you know what? I thank God for blessing me with you. You ever told you, boss? Tell me if you ever in all the years of owning an alcohol had anybody walk in and say, I just thank God for this job. You know, thank God for giving me this job. I thank God for you being my boss. You're thinking on it. I'll get back to you. You think on that one. You know, think about it. When's the last time you walked up to your Sunday school teacher and instead of saying, hey, good job, say, I thank God that you're my teacher. When's the last time you went out in the streets and said, let me tell you something. Instead of going out in the streets and saying, man, did you, you, you how's y'all's choir? Boy, I just can't hit a right note. How's your preacher? He's a nut. You know, it's to go. When's the last time you went out on the streets, in your family, in your community, and said, you know what? God has blessed me. Good family, good church, good job. Now, we're quick to say, oh, I got a hangnail. Oh, I got an ingrown toenail. We, you know, oh, I got split ends. We, we'll complain about every little thing that comes along. When's the last time we just simply went out? And I'm not, listen, I'm not saying when's the last time we thank God. We might do that. When's the last time we went out on the street and praised God in public for what he's done? Do you think that might change the perception some people in this world have of the church? Do you think that might change the perception some people in the world have of God if God's people all of a sudden started talking good about him? Quit taking the credit for what happens right and blaming him for everything that goes wrong. I want to ask you to bow your heads this morning. You're here, and you say, I am a follower of Christ. I am a believer. And this morning I know I have been blessed beyond measure. I know that it's not of anything I've done, I know that anything I have, everything good that's happened to me has been a blessing of God. I know He's been good to me. Far better to me than I ever deserved. Shoes on my feet, roof over my head, friends, family, church. You want to come and you want to kneel at this altar and say, Lord, I just want to thank you first. I just want to tell you how much I appreciate and love you I'm so quick to blame you. I'm so quick to gripe about what I don't get and what I don't have when things don't go my way. This morning, Lord, I'm not coming to ask for a thing. I'm not coming to complain about a thing. I just want you to know I appreciate all your good gifts. Placing me in a free country, in a good church, good family, my children, my wife, my parents. I just want to thank you. Just want to thank you. God, I want you to help me when I go out of here. God, guard my words. I know it's so easy to complain, so easy to gripe. But God, you've blessed me. You've given me so many successes, so many victories, so many good things in my life. God, I just want to, I want you to help me when I go out, when I go to the store, when I go around my family. Let me have a, a joy in my heart and a song on my tongue to tell others how good you've been to me. You're here today and you don't know Christ. Let me tell you something. What excited Mary, what excited John, what excited Simon Peter was the fact that Jesus Christ had conquered death, hell, and the grave. He had been resurrected so that you and they and me could be saved. You don't know him today. You're not a follower of Christ. You need to come to this morning. Let us show you from God's Word how you can be saved today. Maybe this morning you need to start right now. You need to turn around you need to go to maybe your spouse or your children or your Sunday school teacher, your deacon, whoever. And say, I just want maybe somebody that just has been a blessing in your life. And say, you know what? I just want to thank God for you. I want, I want to thank God for blessing me by putting you in my life. As God speaks to you this morning, let's get over the moaning and groaning. God's blessed us with victory. We ought to live like it as we stand together. Thank you.